Chapter 1. Death in the Maples. Many years earlier. Terran, look out! Camerack swung past me with a wild look of excitement in his eyes. He nearly knocked me off the tree trunk that I'd been standing lookout on. The rope creaked loudly in the branches above our heads and then flipped up as Camerack let go and dropped into the lake. For crying out loud, Cam! I yelled at him. I thought we were trying to be stealthy! Camerack shook his long hair and wiped the water out of his eyes. He looked like a scarecrow, all limbs and hair and smiles. His wide eyes reminded me of the eyes of the children at the Evenstide Festival in our small village of Corna, when the trees were lit up with lights and the skies exploded with fireworks. We were different in so many ways. He was constantly in motion. If his mouth wasn't spewing out whatever nonsense came to his brain at the time, he was whistling some goofy melody or chewing on a piece of grass. He was forever getting into trouble. The leaders in our village called him incorrigible. He said he said was simply curious. He was by far the craziest, most unpredictable person I had ever met. And he was my best friend. I know, he called back, but you should have seen the look on your face. I almost drowned down here from laughing so hard. Besides, I don't think they're coming. He was probably right. We had been waiting in the Ricewood Forest for a clan of badgers. We had seen them a few days past and guessed that they had a set somewhere down here near the water. I thought one of them looked hurt and wanted to see if I could help. It seemed like we had guessed wrong. The ricewood was a huge forest that stretched for miles and miles to the north of our village of Corna, and the badgers could have dug in anywhere. Come on, Taryn, Camera called. Jump in! I shook my head no. It wasn't that I didn't like a good swim. I just wasn't as reckless as Cam was. There was no way I was going to risk the 15-foot drop from my perch on the stump to the water below. Who knows what might happen? And besides, this early in the spring, the water must have been freezing. I don't know how Cam could stand it. I'll go swimming tomorrow, I said. I want to scout around a bit for their set. Chicken, Cam taunted. He was always like that, always trying to push me beyond my comfort zone. Perhaps that's one of the reasons I liked him so much, though I would never admit it to him. I was just, by nature, a more cautious person. Others pushed me too, but in ways that I never felt comfortable. You should be a hunter, my teacher said. You spend so much time in the ricewood, and you can get up close to any animal you want. But I didn't want to be a hunter. I had no desire to kill the animals that lived in the forests around our village. It wasn't that I was opposed to eating meat. I know that was a necessity of our survival. I just couldn't be the one to do the killing. I wanted to heal. I couldn't justify healing and killing the same animal. It would be like fresh water and salt water flowing out of the same spring. I just couldn't do it. You should go out for the combats, others said. You would be a champion. The combats was a yearly event where boys would compete in feats of strength, and the main event being wrestling. Although only 16, I was bigger than all the other kids of my age. In fact, I was bigger than kids several years older than me. They described me as big-boned and husky, and I was exceptionally strong. It was a big deal to have a champion from your village, and ever, every year since I was 8 years old, I felt the pressure to join. But I never did. I had my reasons. I guess that's why I didn't mind it when Cam pushed me. If I really didn't want to do something, he never made me feel bad for not wanting to do it. I think he genuinely just wanted to share the sheer delight of whatever adventure he was having. I'm going down to look by the maples, I called down to Cam. Okay, he replied. I'm going to dry off and I'll catch up with you. The Maples was our name for a strand of trees that stood at the far end of Wilsman Lake, near where the Spur River flowed in. There were lots of trees around the lake. There were the coniferous pines and firs with their spiky needles and rich scent. There were also many deciduous trees, like the oak and the birch, whose fallen leaves over the years made a spongy carpet on the forest floor. There were maple trees, to be sure, scattered here and there throughout the forest, but at this one particular place there were several maples that grew together, creating a space in the woods that Cam and I always imagined as sort of magical. Often we would stop there in our tramps around the lake. We would look up at the tops of the trees and imagine that long ago wizards and elves and other forest creatures would meet here on a midsummer's eve. There would have been feasts and dancing, and the forest king would proclaim his peace and reign over them all. It was a perfect place, and one that few knew about, because you had to travel a ways up the spur to find it. 
One Midsummer's Eve, several years ago, Cam and I were going to spend the night in the Maples. We had packed our few things, mats to lie on, food for the evening and morning, and an extra pair of clothes. At the last minute, Cam's uncle, Sapphiris, had had an accident at the mill, and Cam had to travel with his family to Locksfield, his uncle's village. I should have gone by myself anyway, but the night proved darker than I anticipated, and the thought that maybe the Maples was actually inhabited by magical creatures was enough to keep me safely at home. I headed out into the forest along the secret trail that only Cam and I knew about. We had used broken sticks and piles of rocks to mark the trail, but we barely paid any attention to them anymore. I always had a sense of where the Maples was. It was like gravity pulling me there, like I could find it with my eyes closed. Today was no different. As I walked, I took inventory of the woods around me. I could see the nest of the Sanjay. Its mournful song could be heard throughout the spring and summer, and had recently begun to sing. I always felt like its song was personal, just for me, and once I had learned to whistle it in return, I would have long conversations with it sitting in the forest. I saw some animal runs and knew that from the fresh scat on the trail that deer had been through recently. I was so lost in my wonder of the woods that it wasn't until I was almost at the maples that I realized how quiet everything was. It's not like the forest was a noisy place. But there were the regular sounds that I had come to expect on my walks. Often I would hear the creaking of the trees as they swayed gently in the wind, or the crick-crick sound of the fir beetle. The sounds that usually made up the backdrop of life that surrounded the lake were silent. It hit me all of a sudden, and I froze in my tracks. Something was not right. Slowly I turned in a full circle, scanning the forest for as far as I could see. Nothing appeared out of place, but I had the feeling that I was missing something. I must have stood there for several minutes because, all of a sudden, I heard Camarack whistling. I saw him coming through the forest, swishing a branch back and forth. I waved my arms, and when I got his attention, indicated to him to be quiet. He came up with a mischievous look on his face, as though he thought I was playing a trick on him, and he was going to figure it out before he got caught. What's going on? he smirked. Shh, I said. Listen. He stood there with his hands on his hips, and the smile on his face slowly started to disappear as he took in the silence that surrounded us. What's going on? he asked a bit more seriously this time. I don't know, I replied, but something feels very wrong. Have you been in the maples yet? he asked. No, this is as far as I got. Well, let's take a look. Cam started out cautiously ahead of me. He could be quiet in the forest when he wanted to. I was always quieter, even though I was bigger, but Cam had a certain stealth to him that made tracking together often successful. Side by side, we crept the last few hundred yards to the maples. The great trees stood there as they had for the last many decades, as though they didn't even notice the passing of time that went on around them. At the edge of the clearing, Cam indicated that he would go one way, and I should go the other. Although we had been to the maples hundreds of times, this felt like the first. It was like stepping into a place that I'd never been before. The dirt seemed darker, the ferns and grasses larger. And while it looked peaceful and serene, there was an om And while it looked peaceful and serene, there was an ominous sense around me, and I felt the heat of fear building inside my chest. Two things happened almost simultaneously. The first was that I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye. When I jerked my head in that direction, I caught a glimpse of something large heading off into the woods away from the lake. It was definitely manlike, but it was even bigger than me. It was wearing something yellow, like a coat or a poncho, and I saw a flash of steel as the light of the sun glinted off something it was holding, and then it was gone. At almost the same moment, I heard Camarack cry out my name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I was running in his direction. I found him at the far side of the glade, looking down at the ground. His ashen face held a look of terror that I had never seen before. Terringer, he said. He almost never called me by my full name. I approached the last few steps tentatively until I could see what he saw. There on the ground was the lifeless form of a fox. I had seen dead animals in the past, but nothing like this. This one had been pinned to the ground with long, jagged spikes and then skinned. 
Presiding over the corpse, the fox's head was pierced by a sharp stick and then stuck. Presiding over the corpse, the fox's severed head was pierced by a sharp stick and then stuck in the ground as though the small animal was taking one last look at its worldly body. Blood pooled around and under the noble creature, and as if that wasn't shocking enough, there was a name awkwardly scrawled in the blood-soaked earth. Terringer. This is horrible, whispered Camerack. The quietness of his voice matched perfectly the stillness of the glade. Horrible was the only word for it. I had never seen anything as horrific in all my life. When I was eleven, I had seen one of the loggers get his hand crushed by a falling tree. That was terrible, but it paled in comparison to the atrocity I saw in front of me. There was a ringing in my ears, and I felt nauseous in my stomach. I wanted to run. I wanted to scream. I wanted to faint. Instead, I reached down instinctively and began to fold the skin over the small frame. I removed the head from the stake and put it back in its appropriate place. Without knowing it, I was trying to heal the poor creature. It was hopeless, I know, but I couldn't stop myself from trying. After several moments, Cam placed a hand on my shoulder. This one is for burying, not healing, he said. Of course I knew he was right, but I wanted desperately to use whatever skill or magic I had to turn back the tide of wickedness that had befallen this poor, innocent animal. After several more moments, the reality of the situation finally hit me, and a sob escaped from my lips. Although animals die every day in the forest and are left exposed to be consumed by other animals, it, I did not feel that Cam's idea of burial was out of the question. So, in silence, we dug a small hole and gently laid the animal in it. We packed the dirt around its carcass and placed several stones on top of the mound once we were done. It was a sad business, but my sorrow was quickly turning to rage. Finally, Cam broke the silence. What does it mean? he asked. We could still see my name carved in the ground. It made no sense. Why would someone do such a terrible thing in the first place? And then why would they scrawl my name at the scene? Did you see the man in the woods? I asked, for I was certain now that whatever I had seen running away into the forest was the perpetrator of this heinous act. No, what? What did you see? Cam asked. I saw something, or, or rather someone, heading off into the woods just before you called my name. I indicated the direction with my hand. I am sure whatever or whoever it was had something to do with this. Well, who do you think it was? Cam asked, now angrily scanning the forest in the direction I indicated. Like me, he was incensed that anyone could perpetrate such wickedness. I don't know, I replied, but somehow he knew who I was. But what does killing an innocent animal and carving your name in its blood supposed to accomplish, asked Can. How am I supposed to know, I said a bit testily. None of this makes sense. I feel sick and I feel angry and I feel confused. Whoa, whoa. I'm not... I don't know. Don't get all defensive on me, Taryn. We'll figure this out together. We have to go after him, I finally said. You bet we do. Nobody should get away with that kind of stuff. Even though it was starting to get late, we weren't deterred in the slightest. Cam stepped over to where my name was carved in the earth and rubbed it up with his foot. You had nothing to do with this, Taryn, he said, and it wouldn't be right to leave your signature behind. It was a small gesture, but it meant a lot to me. I felt my courage and conviction strengthened, and with Cam in tow, I headed off in the direction I saw the killer leave. He wasn't doing much to hide his trail, and we were able to follow it with ease. We ran with the smooth comfort we had acquired over many years of racing through the woods. Sometimes Cam would notice a sign, and other times I would. We trusted each other's senses and felt like we were making up ground in a hurry. Everything was going along perfectly until we came upon the mist. A huge, opaque facade of grey rose before us like the imposing wall of a haunted castle. We stopped in our tracks. I had heard of the mist, but had never actually seen it. It was talked about around campfires by those that claimed they couldn't be scared by anything. Some said there were evil creatures that lived in the mist and devoured their unsuspecting victims. Others said it was the heaviness of the mist that caused people to lose their way. Though the stories of the mist were many, the bottom line was generally the same. People simply disappeared in it. I knew this personally because my real mother, Shamia, had succumbed to its mysterious and dreadful power when I was only a baby. I was definitely afraid. 
What should we do? asked Cam, looking at me nervously. He also knew the story of how my mother had disappeared, and I could tell he didn't want to go in there any more than I did. It looks like his tracks lead right into it, I stated what I knew Cam already had deciphered. Maybe he will disappear like all the others. It would serve him right, Cam responded vehemently. Again, we stood there looking at the mist. There's nothing more we can do, I said, trying to sound brave and matter-of-fact. We'll just have to keep our eyes out in case something like this ever happens again. Hopefully... This is the last we will see of him, whoever he was. Cam agreed, and we turned away from the mist and hurried home. We decided not to tell anyone what had happened, but to just keep it between us. The more we thought about it, the more convinced we became that I didn't actually see anyone running away. The tracks we followed must have belonged to someone or something else. We saw no more of the mysterious villain, and since no one reported anyone missing, we concluded that it must have been my imagination. Still, the fox was dead, and someone was to blame, a fact that we conveniently chose to disregard. By the end of the week, we weren't talking about what happened any more, and simply considering a mystery that would remain unsolved. But while we chose to ignore what we had witnessed, the same wasn't true in return, for even though we didn't know it, Evil was far from being done with me.